Alrighty, good morning. <clears throat> this is Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru on Just In Time Productions Games Mastery Series, episode number 10. And I thought this week we would try something a little different. Up until now, I've been basically pontificating. And I think that when we are looking at becoming dungeon masters and game masters and storytellers, we need to make efforts to actually do the work, if you will, and so I thought this week we would sort of put together an initial adventure together, and so what I propose will be a series of steps that I go through basically every time I'm putting together a session, uh, well in advance of the session, so that I have a very clear mental picture of what's going to be going on in the story and uh, the kinds of permutations I anticipate. So. Because this is the very first time doing this and we will be using a lot of the pieces that we've already talked about, I'm not going to do a lot of explaining of individual pieces. I'll refer you to earlier videos or, of course, you can uh, post any questions you might have here on the, the video itself or uh, can shoot me a personal message you either which way. So let's, let's talk about how to create a story and let's... Let's start small. So the first thing you have to consider is a location. Now, a location might end up being four or five different sub-locations. You might have a central point that the story keeps coming back to. It might be uh, a progression from an original starting point that moves to a, a secondary location or whatever. So let's talk about what those might look like. And in the... In, in case number one, let's 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 use uh, we'll use whatever name of a town you come up with. In in my case, I'm going to come up with today uh, a town called Bantu, and Bantu in my case is going to be created specifically for an interaction that I anticipate for my adventure league uh, game tonight. So this uh, town of Bantu. By nature, you have to figure out, first of all, is this a well-traveled location, an isolated location? Uh, is it part of a trade route? And there's a lot of variables that could play into it, but let's just pick one to start with to be a defining term. So in this case, it's going to be the lost village of Bantu. So now this Bantu is uh, the, the, the nation that I'm operating in is... Uh, uh, pronounced variously either chult or kult. Um, I prefer the, the, the concept of the Cthulian, Cthulian or Cthulian uh, pronunciation of kult. So this uh, town, the reason why it was uh, or became lost is that it was actually built by a tribe of uh, aboriginal dwarves. Uh, in this case, the <clears throat> the framework I'm using is uh, rather specialized. Of course, each of each each of you is going to create your own story, so I anticipate the pieces will be slightly different. But let's let's go with uh, this development. I've now established that I've got a town named Bantu, and that it's a lost town, which means that it does not have any ties with external sources. So then therefore begs the question, why would there be even what's left of a town? If it was lost and cut off, why wouldn't people just leave? Well, <clears throat> in my case, I'm going to anchor it to one of the critical resources in Kult, and that is fresh water. So Bantu has some form of natural spring. Maybe it's a well. I haven't actually created it yet, so in, in your version of the story, uh, if you're going to be using the same kind of a structure, then you're going to want to come up with why this resource is limited and, more importantly, why is it that it works here and doesn't work other places? Well, in this case, I'm envisioning already that the the reasoning behind this has a, has a mysterious property, that there's something special about the water beyond just being fresh and clean. Let's let's uh, 
say that it has some form of magical property. So that sounds appealing, sounds interesting. We're now building a little bit of intrigue into this town of Bantu. But when you say town, that word itself is kind of uh, arbitrary. What? How big is a town? You know, some people call Chicago Chi Town. Is Chicago a town or a city? You know, so when you speak of a town, you have to kind of get a mental picture. So what I, for for myself, have come up with is a basic, basically a distinction. If a town is smaller than four families, it's not a town; it's a hamlet. Uh, I just uh, kind of arbitrary use that that, that def definition four or five households it's a hamlet if it's more than four or five households if there are uh, say 50 to 300 people in the town it's not even yet a town it's now we're only talking about a village so if the town of Bantu is missing now we're talking about something that's a little bit larger than a village so instead of yeah, maybe 10 or 15 families now we're talking three thirty 50, maybe even 100 families. That's a huge population if you think about it. 100 families and you figure the average family is about four or more. Uh, you know, 30 families times four, you're talking a minimum of 120 people. Now, as a side note, you probably are familiar with the term monkey sphere. Uh, if not, it's basically they did a test to determine exactly how many connections a person can make to hold together. I guess it's monkey, monkey verse. But anyway, you, you, you reach out to as many people that you actually know, and that number comes out to somewhere between 100 and 120. So feasibly, if you're talking about a very small town or a very large village, hi, Jeanette. Uh, when you're looking at a, a, a moderately sized uh, village or a a very small town, you're looking at basically everybody you could possibly know in all of your lifetime being somebody that's there close to you. So in this now creating, <laughs> now creating um, this, this uh, lost town of Bantu, now we know we're looking at somewhere north of uh, 30 or 40 families. We're looking at, you know, 100 people. So a hundred still sounds small, but that's only in our world where we're dealing with things like thousands, millions, and billions. But the the the, re, the, the core reality of it is that most of us couldn't possibly name a hundred people in the town that we live. And uh, I challenge you perhaps to uh, rack your brain and try to figure out exactly how many people that are in your monkey sphere, or your monkey verse, so to speak, to to get an idea of what you have to deal with when you're building a town. I mean. If we're talking about an adventure, we wanted to have enough personalities that the players can interact with to get a good feel for the town, but we don't want to make it so overburdensome that they they can't get information. So for me, again, what I generally do is I figure out how many families are, are in town, and then I build the families. I don't necessarily build individuals. So let's do that. In, the, in this case of, of this town that you're, or this, this encounter you're building, you figure out the size of the population now, and now I'll go on up the, the scale a little bit to give you better depth so that if you wanted to, you could go larger. But uh, now let's say you're going from a town to a city. That usually requires something significant that would draw people to it because generally cities are, are, are either in a growth course or a death course. And either which way you have to come up with why, what the, what's the reason for that city or town to uh, even exist. Some of the primary ways to do this for a city in particular would be to actually consider what the business draw is. What is it that's drawing people together? And quite frankly, in, in most human encounters or engagements, there's either a financial or a religious or political reason why they're drawn together. So let's let's look at this prototypical adventure that you're writing. In my case, Bantu as a town I've already established. I've said that it's a lost town, so now I have to figure out why it's lost because, again, maybe, and now that I think about it, more than likely Bantu was at one time a city and it's just dwindled and dwindled until all that's left is this 
uh, vestige of a town. So there were more families at one point. So why would that be the case? Well, in this case, my adventurers have just recently left the riverbed and are starting to trek inland, although they are paralleling the course of the uh, river. I'm trying to remember the river's name, but I'll think about it in a second. They're, as they're traveling south into the jungle, this town must have had a, some kind of significance. It may be a religious significance. It might be a political one. Um, in this case, I'm not going to look at those. I'm going to look at those from an economic standpoint because, A, I just recently had them run through a religious temple, and so, well, maybe I could build off of that, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, and if I go through and I've already determined the town to be lost, it'll be hard to make it an economic reason. So I'm gonna, gonna still going to hold to it being a political reason why it's no longer here. And so we're going to tie it to the uh, religion of Atem. Uh, now, if you're wondering what that, that gesture was in uh, cult uh, language, is amplified by visual hand signals as part of words. So literally, you can't say the name of these, this particular religion without including Atem's symbol. Now, this allows me to build into a tabletop game a physical reason for individuals to in engage. Uh, in this case, when we're looking at it, we're, we're going to take this uh, town. I'm going to tie with it the religious aspect. I've already said there's probably something mystical about the water. So let's say that the water is autumn's tears. That's, that's a good angle. So one of the reasons for including stories is the inclusion of tips and tricks and, and techniques for the players to grab a hold of and build the story on. They've already had at least one encounter with the uh, Temple of Atem. In particular, uh, Shuckle spent some time talking to the high priest and being informed of the aspects of this monotheistic faith in a world of polytheism. So we'll see where this progresses. Now let's go back to talking about the, your town. Um, in your adventure, in, the, in your place, now that you've just established the size of the community, um, you'll want to figure out which are the primary players. Now in this case, my lost town of Bantu, I envision there would be, uh, because it's a heretic faith, the, the people of Kult operate under tribal uh, councils. So in this case, I envision there being a singular leader. And while others might call him a despot, I envision that the leader of this Bantu to be a very religious man, maybe a, a zealot. And from the standpoint of this being a withdrawn culture or a lost place, I'm going to make the population of the area uh, a form of barbarianism. They're, 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 they're out here far enough and, and, and withdrawn enough that they don't have the common decencies even of the average cult population. This then leads to the question in your, in your adventure, now that you've got the idea that you're going to come up with this location and you've got this justification for why it's there, who are going to be the drivers? What are going to be the, the, the particular players? Now, if you stay down at the village size, you only have to come up with oh, 30 or 40 different motivations if you wanted to map the entire population. But generally speaking, this can be more than a player group can handle in a single session. So unless you're planning on building a mini campaign to occur around this location, if it is truly a one shot, pick one, maybe three families that the players will interact with. Maybe they'll meet with multiple members of those families. They might meet some outsiders that can give information about these families, but realize that the drivers, you need to limit those. So once you have an idea of who the drivers are going to be, now you need to build some backstory. How did they come to be at this location? What were their purposes for being here? And what 
drew them to remain. In, in my case, as the city is in collapse, or the town, the city collapsed to a town, why are people still here? Well, let's let's say that the uh, the chief spokesman, if you will, for this chief, this this despot, um, is going to be under the name of Targin or Targina, Targina. We'll go with that. Uh, brain just pulls stuff from anywhere, so don't worry about where you come up with it. I can, I, I will have within the uh, Game Mastery Academy. There will be at your fingertips name generators for a wide variety of types and, and, and styles of players, and you'll be able to uh, work off of those for your own. But in this case, I'm going to go with Targina. So uh, Targina is a is a despot, and at first I said male, but I was thinking male. But given the location in Colt and the adverse relationship with the older, more established tribal council concepts, let's say Tarkina is a woman, and uh, her draw to this place is that she is the only one that can activate the mystical properties of the waters of Bantu. Ooh, that even sounds good. Anyway, so now we've got uh, uh, the, ma the major, if you will, nemesis or challenge or driver to the story. We need to find anchors to keep the or get the players involved. Let's take in this case the fact that my, my adventurers have already discovered an alchemy jug. The emblems on the outside of the alchemy jug are going to parallel the, the religious markings here, because this is an out shoot or an out uh, buyer from the crocodile and man cult. Yeah, there we go. So. They'll naturally want to look for things they might know about that alchemy jug. And when you're dealing with developing a one-shot or a single session event, you also have to be very careful to isolate and control all the possibilities. Because right now my brain started racing about what, why isn't this cult expansive? Why, why isn't it found in other places in the nation of cult? Why haven't they been more proselytizing if if she truly has this mystical power why isn't it extensive beyond that and so that's what the kind of limiters you need to start being able to put on your story building because the story arc has to have a beginning a middle and an end that can occur within the time frame of a session unless you're going to write a campaign we'll, we'll, we'll go into more campaign details in another another one. but this right now we're just building a single encounter single in that single adventure so once you've got Nemesis location, you need to start building on um, the different encounter locations. So clearly, in the case of the lost town of Bantu, there's the water source. This can be revealed or it can be hidden. It can be only known by the specified cult members, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's lots of ways you could uh, limit and control it. So in my case, I know I'm going to have an encounter at the water's edge. I also envision that there will be a conflict when they meet up with Targina and her followers early. And finally, there will be some big tussle over the, the secret of Bantu, whatever it is that's actually causing the problem. Now, I've already, in my head, I've just, just now, I finished the entire adventure. See, in in the creation process, for me, there are, have been all these different years of experience, so I can catalog, I categorically leap from section to section and finish a mission. Mission. But let's go back to playing with, playing around with yours. What what is your town? Who is your nemesis? What families are involved? What encounters will there be? Now, notice we haven't talked anything about monsters yet. <clears throat> In my way of thinking, a monster or a creature that you intend to unleash on the party needs to meet a couple of requirements. Number one is clearly it has to be in the same uh, challenge rating as the players, something they can handle, or you have to have written into them limits that prevent them from being uh, wiped out by the uh, engagement itself. Second of all, 
you have to look at it from the standpoint of looking at the uh, biosphere for that monster, that creature. On the extreme end, if you had a Tarrasque wandering around, why isn't it eating the whole planet? Why is it even in existence and, and how did it come to be here? Um, in the case of uh, going back to Bantu for a second, I envision the uh, there would be a bit of uh, the idea of drawing from uh, literature. And I, I won't go into, hey, Scott, glad to have you with us. Um, just as a recap, catch Scott up. We are actually today in this session building an adventure. So to catch you up, the first thing you have to look at in a Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you teleported. Nice. All right. So you're you have to come up with the central location. In this case, I chose a town, and I talked a little bit about the size of towns. We talked about that in an earlier adventure, uh, earlier session. There we go. My brain's going on adventures. Well, in an earlier session, we talked about this already somewhat, but come up with the idea of where your location is and what it's. Uh, uh, value is what it's uh, how big it is and once you know that then you have to figure out who your drivers are in the case of a town or a, a small town or a large village you're looking at maybe 30 to 40 families if you're going down smaller than a into a village you can go all the way down to three or four families below that you actually fall into what I consider to be the category of a hamlet uh, so when you do this scaling, you're able to determine exactly how magnet, what the magnitude of the encounter will be, how many people will be impacted by this action. In the case of the story that I've I've created to this point, we're looking at the lost uh, villa, lost town of Bantu, which we also determined to be in in a retrograde. That the town is falling away from what had been a great city at one point and that it is because of a religious order that stands in opposition to the uh, cultural structure of tribal councils and instead is being guided by a single despot, uh, a, a, a woman. We haven't really decided her, her class yet, but she's a, uh, a priest or at least an uh, advocate for Atem. And so as a spokesperson or speaker for or, or, or priest of Atem, she's the one that the, the townsfolk are coming to for guidance and for the blessings of the mysteries of Bantu. In your case, you'll want to go from the small town structure or the village structure or the city structure and then work backwards to who your primary players are, what towns people are involved, what, what, what families are involved, and then from that work sideways, if you will, into who the nemesis is, who the challenger is, who the person is that the players are going to need to uh, uh, put themselves in opposition to for the encounter to occur. Since this is set up as a single shot against a one-shot adventure, you need to make sure that whatever you come up with stays small. So you'll find that the economy in, involved in, in creating an adventure of this scale is to limit, keep cutting down instead of building up because the brain will just take you anywhere. Let's, let's isolate. So in this case, the town of Bantu has a limiter. Population is declining and yet there's some reason for them to stay. It has something to do with the waters of Bantu and Targina knows the, the, the keys to this water. In your case, you'll want to figure out how the, the adventurers got there. Maybe they, as uh, Scott mentioned, maybe they teleported. They came to this place, they're engaging in the in, in, encounter for a reason, so now you have to build that reason. Now, hey, hey Chris, awesome, nice to see you. So. In the case of having a lost town and this water, the party has come here and I, I've built in a hook. 
the la last adventure, they actually acquired an object known as an alchemy jug. At this point, they only know that it creates water. It has certain symbols on it. I'm going to tie those into the uh, visual imagery of Bantu so that they will see it as a place that might have the answers to what the jug is truly useful for, since they have an inkling that it might be more powerful than what they already know. In your case, you'll want to find the reason why the players are engaging. And usually, this is best done by pulling into the story, the character's background and history, or their already established mission. In this case, the party has a mission involved. If this would simply be an amplification of that storyline by embellishing the histories they're already becoming aware of. Once you've established those things, now let's go on to the next part of creation, and that is the visualizations. When you say city, what's the first thought that pops into your head? You're going to think big buildings. You're going to think high population. You're going to think central trade location. Maybe it's a port. Maybe it's a, a hub on a caravan route. Perhaps it's a religious Mecca. It's a place where people come for pilgrimage. In this case, I'm going to establish that Bantu was at one time a tribally, uh, tribal council-led city. This uh, woman, Targina, came in, or maybe better yet, it'd be her grandfather, somebody in a previous generation, came into town and unleashed whatever this uh, water mystery is. They, they, they discovered the well. They... Uh, track down the source of the spring. They found what was behind it all. And this grandfather carried that information forward to his uh, granddaughter, who then carried on to her daughter. And that's how Targina came to know this mystery. And, you know, so I just, again, I just did what I had said to do without uh, being able to articulate how those things popped into my head. But the idea here is that I wanted there to be a reason for Targina to be a, pro, uh, a proponent of whatever's keeping the small population in town. But she had to also, therefore, be in some way heretical to the larger population. Because whatever this is, is also bringing with it something that causes the townspeople to either leave or vanish. And I'm envisioning more, uh, in the case of a jungle setting, more that they simply got up and walked out because it was not feasible to continue at the location. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the monster in this case. We have uh, already established that the encounter is going to be in three locations. There's going to be a tribal contact when they first reach Bantu, and they're going to learn a bit about the background. Maybe they won't necessarily meet Targina at that point, but they'll have an idea of what um, she represents. Then there will be a second where they actually get to experience the blessings, the value of the waters of Bantu, and then ultimately a final confrontation when they discover or uncover or break free the actual mystery behind the waters of Bantu. So in this case, I envision that to be, of course, tied to some of the cult, the, the, the nation of cults, history and religions, and there is a considerable amount of information about a snake god. Uh, that there's a thought that the gods, if you will, manifested in serpent form in order to infiltrate the population, infiltrate the cities, and corrupt them. So let's go with the idea that this uh, mystery has to do with some kind of a snake being. Um, I could look through the books and find there's a, already an established cult of Yanti uh, working in the, the nation of cult. There is already a religious faction that focuses on and pursues the concept of serpent worship, so we definitely tie into that. Uh, there are plenty of ancient mysteries from the uh, earth serpent of, Nor uh, of Norse mythology all the way down to Medusa in the Greek. So there are a lot of ways to anchor in this hideous thing, whatever it is. 
and I'm not going to reveal it because today is Monday, and if my players are meta, they might be watching this and then showing up at the game tonight going, I know what John's going to do tonight, ha, ha, ha. So I won't go that far on this adventure, but let's go with yours again. You've established a location. You've picked up picked out three or four names of families that the parties will be involved with. you figured out who your primary nemesis driver is. you figured out the anchor, what it is that's drawing the, drawing the players to stay in the story. So now you have to come up with the uh, the gravy, the, the pretty stuff. What is what does the visualization of the location look like? In this in this case, I envision Bantu having plenty of um, ancient un unoccupied space, uh, several heavy, nasty, trapped locations set to keep out the natural dangers of cult. The, the dinosaurs and such. So there's going to be a, a bit of that. There's going to be some uh, some either uh, love interest or special interest to cause the players to be delayed if they remain too long. Uh, maybe including cleverly designed marriage rituals or something so that one of the party members ends up married. That would be That'd be hysterical, but uh, whatever whatever that is, it's for your adventure. You're going to want to get a, that hook, so that there's a hook with a lure. There's something that's shiny that the party members want to pursue, but there's going to be an inherent danger in that pursuit. So, in the case of the worship of Atem, there are answers to the legendary questions they have, and more questions to be answered in the future that they can now glean. Finally, you've come up to the actual encounter. And this is, for me, a natural thing. And so again, I have to kind of go into it methodically and mechanically. Dungeons & Dragons rulebook says that you're supposed to set up the monster ratings such that the party members will be put at risk, but that death is not likely. For the most part, they recommend, for example, uh, CR ratings at half or less than the party's collective CR. So going with a group of six first level characters, that means the most they would anticipate I would put towards the party would be one CR3 creature or six half CR or that 12 quarter CR creatures at the most. Unfortunately, that's not the way I work. So guys, surprise, you're probably going to face something a little nastier. But that's because I, I see the template to be slightly different. You want the, the adventure to be raked so that the party is in danger of demise. And only by cleverness can they avoid at least one of their party members going into death saves at some point in the, in the encounter. What I have found is that the the, uh, if you will, the adventure rush that occurs when at least one of your player members is down and literally on death's door uh, makes the adventure more uh, visceral and more memorable. And so I would use a mechanically a one-to-one -one relationship, not playing the uh, CR equivalent at its lethal uh, effectiveness, but at its moderate effectiveness. So, for example, if I was going to go with a CR 6, if these were level 1s, and they're not, there's a few of them that are level 2 already, so if I was going to go with a CR 6 encounter here, I would be looking at either a bundle of uh, say, fanatical uh, religious zealots that are attempting to convert one of the player char characters into a serpent, or perhaps the uh, priestess herself is going to be persuasive enough to potentially convert one of the clerics, or maybe because she's getting on in age, maybe she, her bio clock is ticking and she's wanting to seduce a party member so that she can have a descendant who is uh, as rebellious as she is, and there's so much more we can build into that backstory. So stay tuned for what happens to uh, Targina in the, in the long term. But let's just go with what we have so far and say, let's say I come up with a, a single Medusa. 
Well, single Medusa clearly can be lethal, but they have toned down the effectiveness of uh, petrification so that it is actually something you can overcome, which I found fascinating. But uh, I guess it's lesser versus greater Medusa. Anyway, if there's a Medusa, then I've got to make sure that I give them plenty of clues and hints and warnings that uh, Targina or her uh, beast is a uh, Medusa, and I've got to give them plenty of visuals of terrified statues or something to put them on high alert. Uh, so it's a matter of not only prepping the players in terms of story, you need to also prep the party members in, in uh, reference to their material goods so that they can handle the issue, you know, checking to see whether they have a mirror, looking for shiny objects, um, putting in pickpockets that make them reassess what they own. These are all ways that you can draw the players to uh, ramp up their defenses for the enemy you have before them. Uh, again, the, the purpose is not to kill them, just to put them on the brink of at least somebody's demise. So going back to your, your yours, if we're, look, we're looking at a, a city and you've got a population of closing in on a thousand people, maybe it's a trade route, maybe it's a port, maybe it's a, a mining town. For whatever reason, there are all this larger population what is it that's going to call the players to be pursuing one storyline? That's really the key is to get, get the hooks into the party at a character by character basis so that they collectively want to pursue the direction you want to go. As I said, they're already looking for the, the uh, aspects of what this alchemy jug will do. They found a priestess who's familiar with the crocodile and man mythos and has secrets. The encounter will go down something like this. The first engagement will be finding out about Targina, how dangerous and how much she should be respected. The second encounter where she manifests whatever the mist, the mystery, and the miracle of the waters of Bantu is. And then ultimately when the party members decide to look behind the curtain and look into and pursue what her power base is and find themselves facing with this hideous, in this case, Medusa. Finally, you have to come up with the denouement. What is it that the party gets out of the adventure, win or lose, that makes it worth the effort to have done it? Obviously, there's going to be advantages of knowing more about the story and, and about this religious cult. They're going to learn more about the religious order of Atem, and they're going to find information that will help them in their adventures further on the adventure because they'll learn to how to use their alchemy jug. This kind of a story arc not only builds in reasons and tools and things like that, so the players want to be involved, but it gives you a fundamental place to experiment with new monsters and creatures that you may not have considered. As long as you don't play them at the level of lethality, in this case, the Medusa is not actively trying to turn everyone into stone. She wants to keep some of them for her followers. Maybe now we know what happened to the population of the city uh, of Bantu and why it's only now the lost village. Hmm, that's a possibility. But we do have to talk about the denouement. How are you going to fill it out? How are you going to finish it? In my case, it's pretty easy. They do have to continue their mission. They still have to continue to map the area. They still need to pursue their other adventure pieces. So giving them some information and tools on how to do this in, this, in the story allows them to now become, if you will, Dorothy for future readers or viewers to see what's going on within the story. So now the only scale is, is how to make sure the adventure finishes on time. And this has everything to do with how lethal the adventure has been. If in the first, re first encounter they decided to fight the villagers because of the uh, religious opposition, maybe the fight there goes badly for the people of Bantu and they surrender rapidly. Maybe on the other hand, uh, Tar Tar Targina shows up in the middle of it and throws, uh, throws a, a shadow on the party members and weakens their ability to gain advantage over the local population, thereby moving into the second adventure. Finally, 
when they fight the monster, it really would depend upon how much time you have. And that sounds crazy, but you're actually writing the adventure to fit in the spot, not writing the time to fit the adventure. That's a million dollar question. So let's say they spend all their time in role play and they spend three and a half hours talking with the town folk, discovering that that, that Targaryen has got all things. Maybe when they go to mess with the Medusa, the Medusa's gone for a walk or the Medusa is not in the lair. They're able to get whatever they need to and get out without having to face it. Realize that the whole point of the adventure is not necessary to wipe out the party. Not even necessarily for them to fight the monster, only for them to know the dangers that were ahead of them. And as they make their choices, they can drive the story themselves and feel like it was their accomplishment. And therefore, they feel very clever. On the other hand, you got the adventure finished in your time frame. If, on the other hand, let's say they whip through the town, they go, yeah, 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 we need to talk to Targina. Talk to Targina, blah, blah, blah. They don't trust her. Now they want to go on the discovery of what's behind her mystery. Well, now the lair of the Medusa now becomes critical, and now I can put all the detail and all the effort and all the danger into that last portion, which is, of course, ultimately what the GM would like is to be able to put the characters in that danger directly but it's up to the players. So just realize that when you write the adventure as it stands, realize it may not all get used, but it can always be there for later because even if they don't kill the Medusa now, if they know there is one, they're going to want to come back. And if they have an adverse uh, response to the worship of Atem, they're going to want to come down and close down the heretics. There's all these different ways that the party could be lured back into the lost town of Bantu in the future, thereby starting to build the legacy and the the power of your adventure so that it's not just a one shot but it is an anchor for future encounters once you've done all that the final thing really is to look at rewarding the party members and this is actually an adventure by adventure basis so depending on what you built it for what level of characters and how difficult you wanted to make it you can then gauge the experience. Now, if you use the tables references uh, from the Player's Handbook and DM's Guide, then it's going to tell you how many experience points to earn, and it'll be pretty quick for you. In my case, I generally try to use adventures as milestones. So if they find out everything they need to know about the alchemy jug, they get a certain number of points. If they also find out, or they take advantage of the blessings of Targina, they get benefits there. And then finally, if they also then find out the secret behind her, her, her blessings and then goes back and takes them out, takes out the villain and the monster, then, of course, there's another level of experience for that. So just realize that you have to be flexible both on the creation of the story but also on its resolution to make sure the party members get what they want out of the game. They feel like they've accomplished and you've put them in those serious levels of danger so that they uh, – viscerally feel the adventure. Well, that's going to be our, our wrap-up for this session. I want to thank you guys for being participants. I hope to uh, see you all next week. Uh, we're going to follow on next week with how to start a campaign. We just talked about how to do a single shot. We'll talk a little bit how to start a campaign next week. This is Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru for Just in Time Productions Games Mastery Series. Have a great day.